The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. And starring tonight, two of radio's foremost actors, Leon Janney and Charlotte Holland, in Operation Tomorrow. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip. It will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we journey with a young scientist into the unknown future. It's a story I call Operation Tomorrow. My story begins in a scientific laboratory cut out of the solid rock many feet beneath New York City University. Amidst a maze of electronic apparatus, Professor Wilbur Malcolm, a middle-aged pipe-smoking man, is making methodical tests, aided by his new assistant, Fred Andrews. The main output coils seem to be working the way they should. You ready at the meters, Fred? Yes, Professor. But I wish I knew what we were doing. You will in a few seconds, my boy. Now, wind up that alarm clock and put it here on this lead table in the center of the magnetic field. This old alarm clock? Yes. There. All right, it's in the magnetic field. Now what? Now I'm going to turn on the current. You give me the readings as we go along. Right, sir. Here we go. Readings, please. 1,000 volts positive main output tube. 1,500. 2,000. 3. 4. 5. 6. 7. 8,000. 9. 10,000. All right. We've reached critical voltage. Now watch the clock closely, Fred. The clock? Yes, sir. Why, it's getting a little hazy. Hard to see. Now it's transparent, as if it were made of glass. What is this, Professor? Patience, my boy. Watch and observe. That's the scientist's motto. Well, the tick is getting fainter. Fading out. The clock is disappearing. Professor, the clock has vanished. So it has. Gone completely. But, but where? Don't tell me you've discovered the secret of invisibility. Oh, something bigger than that, Fred. But watch now. I'm going to cut off the alpha tubes. Now I'll cut in the beta tubes. That will give us a negative charge and reverse the magnetic field. You ready, Fred? Yes, sir. Here we go. Readings, please. 2,000 volts negative. 3,000 negative. 4,000. 5. 6. 7. Eight, nine, ten thousand volts negative. Good. I'm holding the field at ten thousand. Now watch where the clock was. I'm watching, sir. Good Lord, I, I see a, a ghost of a clock there. Just a misty outline. Now it's becoming clearer and clearer. It's transparent. Now it's almost solid. Why, I can hear it ticking again. And there it's back. Oh. Yes, Fred. The clock is back. And as you can hear, still in good working order. But where was it? Where did it go? Where did it go? It went into the future. Into the future? Yes, my boy. That clock has just penetrated approximately one year into the future. You've witnessed the first demonstration of something that up to now has always been considered a fantastic dream. Time travel. Good Lord. Ah, that's enough for today. You're coming home with me, Fred, when I tell you my plans. How did you stumble onto this time travel effect, sir? Well, it came about almost by sheer accident. My main purpose, which is a top-secret operation, is to develop electronic controls for atomic spaceships. You mean they've been developed? Oh, no, not yet. But it shouldn't be long now. Science is making incredibly rapid advances. Sometimes it worries me. When you travel so fast, there's danger of a collision. Yes, I know. We're all of us worried that the world is headed for a gigantic disaster, but there doesn't seem to be anything we can do about it. Perhaps there is. 
That's what I've been working around to tell you, Fred. What, Professor Malcolm? Well, this time travel effect that I stumbled on accidentally, I've kept it a secret. You're the only person besides myself to know about it. I'm very flattered, sir. I know I can trust you. And I need your help. I'm not sure we're really ready for time travel. As we were just saying, we're going so fast now, so many new discoveries that we don't know how to handle for the world's good. I hesitate to add one more to the list. I think I understand. But on the other hand, maybe it can be used for mankind's benefit. I have a wild scheme, Fred. Very unscientific. And yet... What is it, Professor? Well, it's this. I propose to send you in a little jaunt into the future. Into the future? Yes. I want you to bring back information. I want to find out what's in store for us mortals of the 20th century, Fred. If it's bad, war perhaps, just knowing about it in advance may make it possible to prevent it. Do you follow me? Huh. It would be like knowing in advance about a train wreck and then seeing that it doesn't happen. I knew you'd understand. That's why I sent for you. As soon as we've completed our tests, I propose to send you through time 100 years into the future. For days and weeks, Fred Andrews and Professor Malcolm experimented until they were sure it would be possible to send a human being into the future and bring him back safely. At last, they were ready for the big test for the actual transmission of Fred himself through time. Professor, I'm all ready. Why are you hesitating? Well, Fred, as we've been working, suspicion has been growing in my mind. What suspicion, sir? I don't think this is going to work. But, Professor, we've sent dozens of objects into the future and brought them back. Even live animals, cats, dogs. Yes, but we've never brought back an object from the future itself. I mean, one we didn't send there. No, that's true, I but... wonder if... Well, no matter, we'll see. Now, remember, gather all the information you can and get back to this spot six hours from now. I'll activate the return field then and bring you back to 1950. Yes, sir, I'll do my best. I guess that's all. Good luck, my boy. Thank you, sir. 5,000 volts positive. 6,000 volts. How do you feel? I feel fine, Professor. 8,000 volts. Fine. 10,000. Critical voltage. You're beginning to move forward into time. You're getting transparent now. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor Malcolm. I can hear you. But you sound very far away. I can't see you any longer. I seem to be in the middle of a fog or mist. Now I'm just surrounded by blackness. I can't hear or see anything. He's gone. Pray heaven he comes back safely. For a long moment, Fred Andrews felt as if he was spinning dizzily through empty darkness. Then the feeling passed, and he cautiously opened his eyes to find himself standing in an empty room, the laboratory which he had just left a hundred years ago. Unsteadily, he crossed the room and with difficulty opened the door. Then he gasped. Outside was a maze of corridors and stairways, brilliantly lighted as if a whole city had been carved out of the rock of Manhattan Island. As he stood there, someone came walking swiftly past him, an attractive girl in full military uniform. I, uh, I, I, I beg your pardon. Yes? But, uh, can, can you What are you doing me... here? Uh, this section is forbidden to civilians. Forbidden to civilians? I... I, I don't get it. How did you get past the guards? Where are your identification papers? I don't... No, 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 wait a minute. Since when does an American citizen have to carry identification papers? Ever since the war started, as huh? you know quite well. Put up your hands. A gun? No, 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 look, miss, you, you don't have to threaten me. I'm harmless. Stand still. I want to see if you're carrying a weapon. Well, satisfied? The only weapon I have is a fountain pen. What's your name? Frederick Andrews, Ph.D. Your draft card, please. Draft card? Look, what's all this about? War, draft card, identification papers. All these tunnels that have been dug down here. I, uh, I'm a stranger here. I don't know what you're up to, but no one can be that ignorant. You're coming along with me to see Colonel Phillips. Colonel Phillips? He's the security officer for this sector. 
And I certainly hope you have a good story to tell him. So your story, Mr. Andrews, is that you've come here from the year 1950. You must realize it's a very unconvincing tale. Completely unconvincing, in my opinion, Colonel. Well, it's the only story I have. I was born in 1923, and in 1950, Professor Wilbur Malcolm of City University sent me into the future. Now I'm here, and, uh, oh, I-, I forgot to ask the date. It's April 10th, 2050. Exactly 100 years. Professor Malcolm's calculations were accurate to almost the minute. Colonel, in my opinion, this man is a very clever spy. Spy? But well, look at that stuff you took from my pockets. The, the, the notebook, fountain pen, my driver's license, dated 1950. Those coins and bills, the, the cigarettes. Surely they convince you I came from a hundred years ago. I think we can settle the question, Mr. Andrews. Our technical department can tell whether this currency is genuine and approximately how old it is. Lieutenant French. Yes, sir. Send all these things by pneumatic tube to the technical department. Ask them for an immediate report. I'll have a report for you in half an hour. When the report comes, Mr. Andrews, I'll know how to handle your case. If you are a spy, you know the penalty. Well, I'm not worried, Colonel. Now, may I ask a few questions? Are you at war? We are indeed at war. And these miles of tunnels I saw carved out of the solid rock. This city has retreated underground, Mr. Andrews. No one lives on the surface now. Good Lord. How long has the war been going on? We've been at war, Mr. Andrews. Off and on, of course, with periods in between in which both sides have rested up for 95 years. Well, a visitor at last. Hello, Lieutenant French. I'm sorry, Mr. Andrews, that we had to keep you locked up until you were cleared. Does that mean you believe my story now? Technical division says your story is true. I'm free now? Uh, Well, not exactly, Mr. Andrews. This is a military sector, and you're a civilian. But I am to be your guide for the time being. Good. Then uh, suppose I call you Emily and you call me Fred. hmm? All right, Fred. There's a great deal I want to see and learn before I go back to 1950. Go back? Hmm. You mean you can return? Of course. Professor Malcolm will turn on his gadgets to bring me back at four o'clock. That's only three hours. I'll have to report this to Colonel Phillips. Um, After I've reported, uh, what would you like to do? I'm anxious to see what's going on. And I'd like to collect a number of books with the latest scientific and historical data to take back with me. Yes, all right. I'll phone the Colonel. Then I'll show you around. Fred, here's the plotting room for the flying bomb attack. Good Lord, it's as big as a theater. And as dark. What's that big board with lights on it? That's the chart board which records every flying bomb within the thousand miles of American territory. Self-guided missile entering detection net over Greenland. General course south, southwest. I have it plotted. Send up interceptor rockets when it reaches zone four. Yes, sir. Rockets 34 and 35 successfully intercepted at defense zone four. Now, you see, Fred, two lights just went out. That means we sent up destroyer rockets, which brought the bomb down. Rocket bombs 29 and 31 have eluded interception at zone three. Interception salvo at zone two. If they penetrate, use interceptor L-100 at zone one. L-100 is our new top secret interceptor, Fred. Hardly anyone knows how it works, but it never fails. Four more lights went out then. Mm-hmm. And here comes the report. Last four rockets successfully intercepted. Roger. Well, Fred, what do you think of modern Rocket warfare? Rocket 25 oh, has penetrated zone it's two. It's horrifying. Interceptor and L-100 everybody is being here launched now. Seems to take it so calmly. <laughs> you can't get excited when a thing has lasted for almost 100 years on and off. That light, hmm? number 25, it's still on and moving But it should have been destroyed by now. Do you suppose... Rocket number 25 has eluded interceptor attack by L-100. It has, but it can't have. Report on 25, please. Detection base 103 reports number 25, apparently new type rocket, non-metallic construction, able to baffle sighting mechanism of L-100. Order technical crew to search for fragments after the hit. Send general warning to eastern seaboard area. Uh, Give plotted strike prediction. Very good, sir. All personnel in Eastern District, all personnel, 
Bomb strike due in 10 seconds. Battery area. Bomb strike due in 5 seconds. 4 seconds. Bomb strike due in 3 seconds. 2 seconds. 1 second. All personnel. Bomb strike over. All right, Fred. I'll take you to the viewing room next. You can see for yourself what this city looks like in the year 2050. Lieutenant French reporting back with Mr. Andrews, sir. Very good, Lieutenant. Well, Mr. Andrews, have a good look around. Uh, yes, sir. I saw the city through the television viewing screens. Not quite the city you left, is it? It... It's unbelievable. Just acres of twisted steel and fallen stone. The skeletons of giant buildings lying across one another, rusting. It's like the end of the world. Not quite. Perhaps not even the end of civilization. Man is an adaptable creature. Hmm. But are we winning, sir? Nobody wins a war anymore, Mr. Andrews. We're holding our own, and we hope when the end comes, there will be peace on Earth forever. But how did it start, sir? We were trying so hard to prevent war back in 1950. In fact, one reason for my trip into time was to get information that might help us keep war from breaking out. Lieutenant French, why didn't we think of that? Think of what, sir? If the world of 1950 knows the truth, maybe it won't happen. Either they can prevent the accident that started all this back in 1955, or at least they'll know the truth when it does happen. Of course, sir. Mr. Andrews can take the true story back with him. What story? I, I don't follow you. Fred, you asked how the war started. Yes. It started because of an accident and an over-jittery world. Yes, my boy, a horrible irony. Fred, now listen. During the 1950s, the government established a special experimental base in the heart of the Arizona desert, in a little town called Red Rock. Red Rock, Arizona? Yes, that's right. The first space rocket was put into production there, and work was pushed on the problem of fuel. During the course of experiments, an explosion occurred late in 1955. It I was see. a terrific blast. Wiped out the whole base. The first reports were sabotaged, that the enemy had blown up the base because they were afraid we were on the verge of getting space flight. Before the truth became known, our newspapers screamed for retaliation. The enemy became panicky and decided to strike first. And phase one of the war was on. When we discovered the blast was really an accident, it was too late to stop. That's horrible, sir. War, because everybody was just too jittery. But it doesn't have to be. Don't you see, if you take back the true story before it happens, it won't have to happen. Now, look, I've assembled a dozen books for you. The information in them will enable your scientists to prevent that blast at Red Rock Base. Now, Fred, you, you've got to get the facts back to them. You've just got to. I will. Believe me. Professor Malcolm and I will see to it this war doesn't start in our time. Good. Now, come along. You've only five minutes more. This is the exact spot where I was lying when I came through the time dimension, Colonel Phillips. You've only 30 seconds more, Andrews. Remember, impress the lesson of the accident at Red Rock on the world. These books, hold them close to you so they'll go back with you. Yes, sir. I've got a good grip on them. Fred... Yes, Emily? Uh, just good luck. Thanks. Maybe I'll pay another trip to 2050. I hope so. It's 1600, and Professor Malcolm is on time. Look, Colonel. He's getting transparent. He's disappearing. Goodbye, Emily. I guess this is it. Hope to see you again sometime. But, sir, the books, they aren't disappearing. They're, they're just as solid as ever. Fred! Fred! What? I, I can hardly hear you. Everything's gray and misty. Are you still there? Emily, are you still there? The books, Fred! Andrews, you're going back with the books! They're staying here! He's appearing. He's returning. Thank heaven he's safe. Fred! Fred, my boy. Fred, what's the matter? You're staring at me as if you didn't know me. Here, Fred, let me help you up. It's I, Professor Malcolm. Professor Malcolm? Yes, 
Don't tell me you don't remember. Professor Malcolm? Yes, yes, Fred. What's the matter? Oh, my, my head feels so funny. I can't seem to remember who you are or what's happened to me. What am I doing here? Well, Fred, how are you? Oh, Professor Malcolm, it's good to see you, sir. I can't tell you how I've been blaming myself ever since the experiment. Oh, nonsense. I haven't suffered any harm. Just a blank place in my mind. I can't understand it. Do you suppose the experiment failed? Uh, you were gone for six hours. Somewhere. That's all I know, Fred. If you did get to 2050, Fred... Yes, sir? Well, I have a theory that though we can move from past to future, it's impossible for anything belonging in the future to move to the past. The structure of time itself prevents that. I see. So if you did try to bring back any books or papers, they stayed behind. Mm, you must be right. You can't remember because nothing that you didn't take with you could come back with you even including sensory impressions on your brain cells. The very act of returning wiped out your memories. Maybe if I went again, we could find some way around the problem. There must be some way, sir. No, Fred. I'm dropping the whole subject for the time being. I've been transferred to a new assignment, and you're coming with me. Well, what is the assignment, sir? All spaceship research is being concentrated at a new base now being developed. And you and I are going out there to help develop a fuel... And we'll take a rocket to the moon. I see. Where is the base, Professor Malcolm? Oh, someplace in the West. I believe they call it Red Rock, Arizona. Red Rock? The name seems awfully familiar to me. I wonder why. This is the mysterious traveler. Well, time travel doesn't seem to be all it's been painted. Especially if you can't remember what's happened when you get back. You aren't worried about the future, are you? You know that tonight's story couldn't possibly happen. Or could it? Oh, you have to get off now. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. <laughs> 